people in here who don't speak Finnish on the level that they will. Anybody prefer to have this in English? Okay, we will have this in English because we have at least one person preferring that. Uh, has happened before that I have had uh, a presentation in English, but then all the people present were Finnish speakers and we agreed that okay, we'll speak Finnish until if, if that happens that any English spe or, or non-native Finnish speaker or somebody who's, who's uh, preferring English would appear and then we'll continue. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Tuomas, uh, also known as DMNT or Jukke. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about radioactivity, radiation, all the fancy effects it causes. Uh, my next question to figure out a little bit on the level on which I should talk about these things. Are there any nuclear physicists in here? <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> if there was, I will have just proposed that we switch places. Um, I'm, go I'm going to do some simplifications, uh, and if there were any, any physicists present, especially if there were multiple, they would have just beaten the shit out of me afterwards. Um, I try to simplify things. I may have some, uh, if I have misunderstood or made a simplification that's just not true, just call me out if you know, but please be gentle. I don't want to cry tonight. Um, and uh, final question, what is like the level, uh, how many think that they know like, let's say, basic levels of concepts of radioactivity, basic levels? All right, good, so we will have, we will have a pretty good level on the slides. A really, really brief history of radioactivity. Uh, three scientists discovered radioactivity uh, in uranium salts. They were trying to figure out that what is this actual, this wonderful thing that, that they do? Why do they seem to have something to do with how the radios were, which was a fancy new invention. Uh, therefore, it was named as radioactivity because it seemed to affect the radio somehow. Um, they found out by placing uh, radioactive salts into a magnetic field that, hey, we have three kinds of, of radiation here. The ones that we are left, the ones that go straight, the ones that we are right. So there must be at least three kinds of different radioactivities because as everybody knows, charged, charged particles in a magnetic field will apply a force that is uh, like the right-hand rule, uh, what is it, perpendicular to the velocity and to the magnetic field. Uh, named after them were two units. Curie is now absolute. Uh, Becquerel is still used as a unit of activity. That is a number of decays per second in material, which means that, that if some piece of metal has one Becquerel, uh, that means that there's one atom splitting every second in this material. X-rays had been discovered a little bit earlier than these. There's a lot of different particles, but the first three ones that they found were, were like basically like alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Alpha is basically a, a helium nucleus without the electrons, pretty massive and uh, positively charged. Beta, on the other hand, is basically uh, an electron or its antiparticle positron and, uh, well, Hopefully, everybody, be, everybody has been attending some courses of physics and know what electricity is. And gamma is just a photon, just like ordinary light. Uh, but typically, when we talk about gamma radiation, it's much more energetic than what the visible light or infrared or radio, uh, radio waves are. Uh, then we talk about neutrons. These are... Uh, uh, the subatomic particles, which make up atoms, together with, with uh, or uh, atom nuclei, with together with protons, and then we talk about this ne neutrino, which is a harmless little fellow. Um, 
It doesn't want to interact with other particles. It's, it has really tiny mass. And uh, about 100 trillion neutrinos go through your head every second, mostly because of the sun is emitting them, but they don't, they don't want to interact with the, with the ordinary matter that much. Um, seem to be only affected by the weak force and the gravity. <coughs> a proton uh, is a positively charged particle in the atom, which kind of like uh, makes different elements. So the amount of protons in the nucleus will basically uh, make the, let's say, the chemical, uh, chemical, chemical uh, these attributes of the, of the atom, if it has like, the, all the electrons and stuff. And then there are counters, more obscure ones, we can talk about a little, little bit later, but they are not that interesting from our point of view. Yeah, moons and everything. So here's a quick diagram about how easy it is to protect yourself from this radiation. Half the particles will be stopped by a sheet of paper. Uh, beta particles by just an aluminum sheets and, and you need layers and layers of, of lead or other heavy uh, or other dense objects between you and the radiation source if you want to protect yourself from the gamma. But the thing with, with the uh, photons is that they are only stopped with certain probability. So there is no amount of stuff that will definitely be 100% effective in theory. Uh, just like if you have a thin slice of onion or any other, other, uh, other edible food and you can just see through it because you know, light will go through this really thin slice because it's a photon. Um, gamma rays test this, this uh, usual rule of thumb that they have, what I stole from somewhere was that, that four meters of lead is like enough for the, let's say, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the gamma rays that are created here on Earth. Tungsten and tungsten alloys might be even more, uh, more successful in this. Uh, there's this uh, <coughs> different measurements or the units. Um, we already talked about Becquerel, and then we talked about dose, which is uh, gray is like physical, uh, physical absorption of how much radioactivity has affected your body. Uh, Sievert also includes that, okay, where, did, where in your body did you actually receive this radiation? Because it's not all equal. Uh, what kind of a radiation it was? Was it alpha, beta, or, or gamma, or protons? And then there's the funny one, banana equivalent dose, because everything around us is radioactive. Uh, your friend next to you is radioactive, uh, mostly because of the potassium, 40, which is everywhere on earth and it will make bananas and people and every, everything, uh, all things living will be radioactive in here. So the question becomes how much radioactivity, how much added risk do we tolerate? This is blatantly stolen from XKCD and split into multiple slides. So top there is sleeping next to someone will give you 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05 microsieverts of radiation. And basically double that if you live within 50 miles of a nuclear power plant for a year. Um, there are things like uh, one microsievert for arm x-ray using a CRT monitor for a year. Uh, as you can see, this is an old old XKCD stuff. But this is, this is pretty regular stuff. Flying on an airplane uh, will lead to receiving some cosmic radiation. And there's the uh, uh, second one from the bottom is the background dose received by an average person over a no one normal day, 10 microsieverts. So we are talking about really small thing. 
but let's take them to scale. All these combined are like three little tiny, tiny, uh, tiny uh, green blocks. And then there are things like, okay, Fukushima accident, if you lived in Tokyo and stuff. Um, right bottom is the maximum year dose permitted for US radiation workers legally. Uh, bottom left is the, is the uh, normal yearly background dose. And it says that most of it is from natural sources. And then uh, almost, uh, almost everything else is from uh, medical imaging. Let's combine these. Um, we get like this uh, bottom left fatal dose, eight sieverts pretty much. Uh, then it says that usually fatal uh, survival possible with prompt treatment, four sieverts, but some sources say that it's actually closer to six, or maybe the medical field has just advanced in a couple of years. And finally, 10 minutes next to the Chernobyl reactor core after explosion and meltdown, 50 sieverts, which is pretty much bigger than anything else. So if you ever visit Chernobyl, don't go standing next to the reactor core. Don't take any, any, any uh, souvenirs. <laughs> yeah, sure, you can do it if your camera works. Actually, uh, there, are, there are many, um, I almost included one in my presentation, but there are actually several videos of people like, hey, I tried to take picture of this object, but then there's this cra crazy white noise it causes to my cell phone, which is a telltale sign that, hey, you got gamma radiation here. It's affecting your, your cell phone camera, causing this effect. If that happens, if, if, it, if the picture goes fuzzy, beware. It was from one gray, it, uh, it was based on the, like the physical, physical dose, but then it's with, uh, it's with, uh, with cofactors such as like what kind of radiation you had uh, and uh, sometimes also like biological things that where did you actually get it. Let's say um, uh, getting uh, your chest irradiated is, or your brain irradiated is much, much worse than let's say your hand. Because well, basically your survival rate without a hand is much better than your survival rate without lungs. Okay, the, so the question, the question was that well, what, where, where does the sievert actually come from? Uh, and I honestly have to say I don't, I don't remember what was the original, where was the original definition of a gray coming from. But sievert is an adjusted gray, uh, gray number with the biological and uh, radiation type factors. So. Um, when, when you have received radiation, there's the acute radiation poisoning, <coughs> which means that you have, you have gotten enough radiation that you feel nauseous, you start throwing up. Um, and the more radiation you got, the faster it will, uh, the, uh, the onset will be. And typically, the longer it will last. Um, let's say uh, anything under two gray, this is, this is again, this is not converted to sieverts, which is a little bit sad, but, but this is, uh, they apparently haven't done like a lot of human experience, so they don't actually know exactly where this line will be. Um, so under two grades, it's pretty much survivable, well, even without, without uh, any, uh, any medical intervention. I think it was like 99% survival rate with less than two gray. Uh, fifty percent survival rate is is without care is between two and six, and uh, I think under four is is pretty much a safe thing if you have medical care at least like acutely. I mean we are talking about short term here. Uh, over thirty degrees is always lethal. Let's say with 
we, go, we will have one, one exception here. And the uh, radiation will basically penetrate your cells and cause cell death, especially like uh, heavily exposed areas, sometimes it will be the skin, typically uh, bone marrow is affected. Anything that, that will uh, have this fast cell, uh, cell creation division, they are the most heavily affected ones. Long term, uh, the radiation will, because it's ionizing radiation, if it, if it hits your, uh, if it, uh, if, let's say, if an alpha particle goes through your, uh, your chromosomes, it's really bad to them. DNA has some repairing functions, but not all damage will be like completely repaired, even with them. Sometimes they will have mutations, deletions, and um, the dose is cumulative. So back in the days, they thought that, okay, well, we will just give our nucle nuclear plant workers like a little bit more vacations and they will just kind of, you know, get rid of it. But no, they don't. It's like really lifelong cumulative irreversible damage, uh, especially for your gametes. So if uh, that's why, uh, that's why in medical imaging, they are especially interested in like like uh, shielding uh, testicles and ovaries for unnecessary radiation. What can do? Time, distance, and shielding. Limit the time you're exposed. Don't hang around. Get as far away from the source as possible and put some dense material between yourself and the source. Of course, with the natural background radiation, this means that, well, you just have to interact with people and you have to live in a house. Fun fact, Finnish, uh, so, uh, Finnish base rock is, is rather radioactive, contains a lot, of, a lot of uranium. All this concrete around us is radioactive. And there's nothing we can do about it. Here's uh, one, one uh, graph that I stole. Again, there's this, like this direct damage. You get radiation, it, it penetrates your DNA. It breaks the DNA, may cause cell death. Indirect damage is that it actually uh, creates free radicals by, by uh, let's say, uh, ionizing a, a water mo molecule or, or freeing like uh, free radicals from it, which then in turn will will uh, will damage your DNA. So we talked about alpha particles, why they're dangerous even if a sheet of, sheet of paper can stop them. We can just wear you know, paper suits, be safe. It's dangerous when it happens inside your body. Radon is a noble gas. Yes, you can't smell it, you can't detect it. Uh, it's a problem in Finland in some areas because of the base rock is radioactive. Uh, the gas is created there, it, it can end up in your house, you just breathe it in. And if it decays inside your lungs, it, it will produce heavy metals, which will love to bind to your mucous membranes. And those are short-lived. And, and short-lived radioactive material means that there's a lot of activity in those. So uh, it, it tends to uh, lead to like a longer chain of events that, that we will have uh, irradiating particles inside your lungs. Also, don't drink water containing radium, that's bad for your health. Um, there typically is a buildup of polonium. Uh, those are the half times. So half time is a time in which half of the material is, uh, is fissioned. And uh, for polo, or, or when the, when the uh, radioactivity, uh, radioactivity uh, when the element is just broken, what is the goddamn word? Should have stick to finish. Anyway, short half times, high activity. Uh, also, if you get uh, like uh, cesium 
in your bones, they can create really nasty long-lasting effects, especially because your bone marrow is next to your bones. But not all compounds are actually water soluble, so sometimes you can be you can ingest some radioactive material that will just kind of be excreted out of your body. Uh, beta particle, less energetic, but has bit of penetration. Typically causes like radioactive burns, uh, radiation burns, if you have been co in contact with the radioactive element. Positron is the antiparticle. Oh, somebody did not do a good job here. I was supposed to replace that with with a beta and a pine plus, but use your imagination here. Um, they are antiparticles, which means that if, the, if they meet with an electron, they will annihilate each other and produ producing gamma radiation, which is, again, a fun, nice thing to have. Uh, sometimes these are used for in cancer, cancer treatment because they are good, good for, uh, for example, on superficial cancers. They don't, they don't penetrate deep into your body and can be used to is to treat cancers. And gamma radiation. Um, this is the energy equation for a gamma particle, or a photon. And uh, the higher the frequency, the more energy it has. The more energy it has, the worse damage it will do to your, your DNA, in theory. If it's energetic enough, it might not actually actually do that. If it kind of do the, some quantum mechanics mysteries, they just don't work as you would expect, but they do something completely different. Uh, they may require some sort of, a, let's say, um, loss of, loss of, uh, of, of energy or something before they can actually do some other Nancy, uh, fancy tricks like, uh, like uh, excite a nucleus or something. Was there a comment yeah. question? Yeah. The mic is dis mic has disappeared. Maybe you can repeat it, but it doesn't interact with your body. Uh, the mic is not working. Could you please uh, repeat the question on your own mic? All right, so, so question. Like it goes to your, if it's as low energy, it goes to your body without interacting with it. So it, it doesn't. So um, if, it ha if it's energetic enough, it will just penetrate your body because it, it uh, you said it doesn't have enough, uh, what? It, it doesn't slow enough, but well, they are always traveling on the speed of light, but uh, kind of like they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't have the, like the, let's say correct energy levels also because the, the wavelength is, is affecting like the probabilities of, of actually like hitting things, which is not what happens on the quantum level. Uh, they can also hit the electrons and ionize stuff by that, so they can just, and again, when I say it hits an electron, it doesn't actually hit, it's not what happens on the macro level, but gives you the idea. Uh, and it can, it can just free electrons or, or change the bindings, yes. Um, uh, actually, there may be a small, small effect, uh, especially gamma radiation may produce uh, more, uh, more melatonin into your skin. It apparently does, does a little bit something, but, but the, uh, the, um, the gamma radiation is energetic enough. It's not, if it's, Let's say if it's closer to the UV range or stuff, so it might be beneficial. But I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biochemist. I'm not. I will say that my skin is not good in Chernobyl. It's. I will. I will. I will pick. No yeah. All right. So, uh, finally, the particle level energies are typically measured in electron volts and not joules because those are so tiny. So we are talking about electron volts, 
which mean, which is the energy that if we use one volt for one uh, one volt to uh, speed up an electron, a single electron, it will have the electron volt energy. Simple and oversimplified. Here are the um, here is yet another picture I I stole. Um, Top, you will see that, okay, does this penetrate Earth's atmosphere or partially? Uh, what, what do we call the radiation type? Starting from radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray. And uh, the scale of wavelength. So, as we know, mostly we are consisting of empty space between the atoms. The atoms are actually, like, or the nucleus, is quite small and uh, and doesn't look anything like that but anyway we are just mostly empty space and that's why the gamma radiation can just penetrate us and uh, the frequency scale is logarithmic so as you can see they they are not uh, linear they are like uh, well everybody knows the exponentiation function i don't need to explain that uh, at the low uh, uh, below, there's this uh, temperature, there's this black object in physics, which creates, uh, like according to the temperature, it's the glow that it has. What, what color is it emitting? Uh, or wh what, uh, what, what is the frequency of the radiation it's emitting, or the peak? And uh, there you can also see that how, how how hard some object must be to emit this kind of a, a photon. And as you can see, well, we are there somewhere in the, our like, uh, natural habitat is somewhere there on the infrared range. Then the fancy stuff, proton, the basically uh, um, a hydrogen atom nucleus. It's strange because its effect, radiating effect is, is strongest where it, where it starts to die off at the penetration. So if people are irradiated, irradiated with protons, they tend to have an effect not closest to the radiation source, but somewhere in between, depending on, on um, how energetic they are. And this is utilized in cancer treatment because you can, uh, let's say, uh, with brain, tumors, you can just irradiate them inside the brain so that you, you can do it from multiple directions. The um, brain tissue around the tumor does not get a lot of, lot of radiation in comparison to the actual tumor. It can be like localized that way. So where do we get these fancy little radioactive things? Uh, this is there's this thing that we utilize now called chain reaction. Um, we can create with radioactive substances here, uh, uranium-235. It's, um, it's a fancy thing because with a thermal neutron, uh, you can actually cause it to, to fission and then it will create more neutrons. And uh, physicists realized that, hey, we can use this for chain reaction, that if we just moderate them enough, that we will have on average, uh, or when we have a good level, we will just kind of make sure that there's only one neutron that, that's hitting another atom, uh, another nucleus, and we can have a, like a never ending, uh, this chain reaction until we want to stop it or, or we run out of fuel. Uh, it seems to have an 82% probability of enduring fission if it's, if it, if it's uh, catching a neutron. Uh, if it doesn't, then it will, it will change into, uh, did, it, did it turn into plutonium anyway? Can't, rem can't remember actually this. And it will produce uh, energy, and now we are talking about mega, uh, mega electron volts, so million times the one volt level, the, the low level I was talking about before. How do we control it? Well, they require thermal neutrons. And thermal comes from the 
couple of slides earlier, we want them, the energy to be under what, what's the velocity of noble gas atoms in room temperature is. But it produces fast neutrons and we need to slow it down to actually be able to continue the chain reaction. Um, in Chernobyl, uh, they also used the graphite as a, as a neutron moderator, uh, as well as they had some uh, had water in there. But now it's like thought to be that graphite might not be the best choice in a nuclear reaction reactor, for reasons we will uh, we will talk about a little bit later when we talk about Chernobyl. Uh, Typical common, common reactor looks like this. We got the reactor core. Uh, it has the fuel rods, those, those uh, fancy, fancy uh, gray lines. And then they got the control rods, which are get inserted between the rods to prevent neutrons from advancing. And then uh, this will generate uh, high pressurized water flow, which is pumped over there to the steam generator, pumped to the turbine. Uh, then condensed back into the water and put back to the steam generator and, pre and keeping separate like the radioactive water which flows inside the reactor core and then the clean water that, that flows in the steam generator. How do we run it? Let's try to maintain criticality on a, like a good average level so that, that we will have a constant thermal power. Uh, new power plants have this negative void coefficient, so if it overheats, it will slow down by itself. Chernobyl had a positive coefficient. So if it will overheat, it will create more heat. Uh, possible problems in a nuclear power plant is fuel poisoning, which is that uh, the uh, decaying, uh, like the uh, fission products will, will uh, will produce uh, atoms that will be, or nucleus that will be the uh, neutron capturers and they will eat off some of these neutrons that are required to, to run the, uh, to run the uh, reactor. And then if you stop the reactor, then you will need to have some time for it to, to uh, for them to fission by themselves causing decay heat, which is an extra heat, which is still being created by these fission products in the nuclear reactor. Uh, then there's this fancy button, SCRAM. Um, it's pretty much like an emergency shutdown for the reactor, which means that all the, all the control rods are driven in and the reactor is, is brought to stop as fast as possible. Um, they, there is this story that they, it, it was from the, uh, what was it, from the uh, Rod, uh, something, something, Rod Axe Man, but I think it's a backronym that it was just, just somebody came up with this, that there was this guy with an axe who, in the first test reactor, that the job was to use the axe to cut down the rope so that the control rods will fall down if, if they need it. Um, and then let's talk about nuclear weapons. Uh, everybody's seen Oppenheimer, but, but I haven't. Um, originally, military thought they are just, you know, big bombs. They're just like conventional bombs. And uh, the scientists, some of them had like really, really crazy, dark, apocalyptic ideas that they are just going to bring, you know, the second coming of Christ by causing this apocalypse or something. Who knows? Um, but the military thought they were just ordinary bombs before they used one. Uh, there's uh, the bombing of Hiroshima on the left, Nagasaki on the right. Um, there was actually three planes that flew to Hiroshima there. Uh, sorry, six planes. Um, uh, actually, the funny fact was that there was the the plane that took these photographs, uh, the plane's name was Necessary Evil. And the fission bomb operation is to squeeze together enough 
of this radioactive material that it goes supercritical. So we will have enough enough uh, neutron production that will just create more and more and more, and the bigger the better uh, until it reaches like uh, temperatures which are not usually seen on Earth. Uh, fusion bombs, however, use typically uh, uh, deuterium and tritium, which are hydrogen, uh, hydrogen with some added neutrons, and uh, for a small fission bomb that will start like create high enough temperature to actually start the fission, uh, the fusion reaction. And let's see the. Little boy, if we, what was dropped in Hiroshima, if, if it exploded on top of us. So the fireball radius will be like 180 meters. So almost all of Mesokeskus. Everything is, <laughs> everything is pretty much vaporized. Uh, beyond that, heavy blast damage. Uh, uh, green area is the radiation radius, uh, likely fatal without medical care. Uh, then we have the thermal radiation radius, which is, I believe, is somewhere around here, like just a tiny one. Uh, oops, it is it. Sorry, uh, moderate blast damage radius, thermal radiation radius, and light damage which is like goes beyond this. But of course if we detonate it in the air the result is much better like in here. That's why they are never actually detonated on, on ground because if we did it on ground somebody brought it to Mesukeskus this would have been the, the total area so uh, the light blast damage will have been somewhere in, in uh, Etelä Haga something so it will be the fireball will be bigger but then the overall damage around it will be lessened. Or if we put the first hydrogen bomb ever exploded on Mesukeskus, this is the damage area and the fireball, uh, everything is vaporized mm. up until Tölö and stuff, yeah. And uh, yeah, light damage all the way to Vihti and Korvo and Siuntio, Kirkkonomi also heavier damage. So as you can see, this is a pretty much bigger, bigger thing. Uh, little boy was 15 kilotons, so that is equivalent explosion to having 15,000 tons of TNT. And first hydrogen bomb will be like 10 million tons of TNT exploded at one place. So we are talking about enormous energies. Before we jump away from Nuclear weapons, anybody want to talk about anything else about them? Uh, one thing, I, oh, there we go. Uh, Zar Bomba, um, it was planned to be 1,000 megatons, but the biggest one they ever exploded was 500 what was actually produced and, and tested. But, but the initial plans was 1,000. Ah, the question was about the Tsar Bomba that was apparently uh, tested next to Finland. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, the plane that carries Tsar Bomba uh, barely, <laughs> barely escaped the explosion it created. And, and uh, that seems to be the reason why they never actually did the, like the full-scale thing, because, well, who's going to fly the mission? Uh, just a small correction. The original Tsar Bomba was 100 megatons, not 1,000. And then they, they reduced it to 50. Okay, uh, was that instant? Fact check, instant fact check, 100 megatons and uh, uh, 100 and reduced to 50. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. When the first atom bombs were tested yesterday, creating a, a chain reaction that will actually destroy the whole Earth was thought as a possible possible event, but luckily didn't seem to happen. If, if, if you're talking about, uh, the question was that there have been some famous pictures from, uh, from Japan about the shadows being imprinted on, on the street or in the, in the buildings. Um, I believe it, it has been the, the, either, uh, either the, the vaporization or then heavy radiation ranges. But I have no further like, exact information about it. Uh, one thing about the explosions is also that they create this electromagnetic pulse, which is whenever um, whenever there is uh, charged particles that accelerate, they will create uh, create uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this will be like not gamma radiation, but but uh, pretty much closer to radio waves and uh, that can actually damage all the computers and electronics and stuff that is not protected from it. Then let's talk about good science, nuclear incidents, near incidents, funny things. Um, on the right hand side is a, is a German radioactive toothpaste. It was radioactivity was new and exciting concept so uh, it got some quacks um, and of course if you can use something to cure cancer it must be good for everything else too right so uh, the Duramad packaging said special biological healing effects by radium rays a thousand times medically prescribed and recommended and on the tube itself read what does Duramad do through its radioactivity, it increases the defenses of teeth and gums. The cells are charged with the new vigorous life energy which inhibits bacteria in their destructive ability. Hence, the exquisite, uh, exquisite prevention and healing effect on gum diseases polishes enamel to the softest shiny white, prevents tartar approach, good form, new taste, pleasant, mild and refreshing, used extensively. Dark, dark history. Left. Radium girls. Um, girls who were painting the dials that glowed in the dark in the watches. So uh, they were specifically instructed to, to shape the brushes they used to paint using their uh, lips and tongue. And uh, this was because it was slower to dip it in water and use, use, use uh, rags or anything like that. And uh, as as a consequence, some of them actually had to have their jaws amputated because of radium jaw, because the bone will just die. Uh, on the right hand side, mm -hmm, I seem to have broken my watch. Uh, on the right hand side, there's radioactive water containing radium, and uh, a man called Eben Byers, a wealthy American socialite, athlete, industrialist, and a Yale College graduate. Uh, he was said to die from uh, radium poisoning in 1932, but actually the cause was uh, cancer, or multiple, multiple cancers. He was uh, this radical water heavy user. Uh, he was buried in a lead-lined coffin, and when he was exhumed in 1965 for a study, his remains still were pretty radioactive, measured at 225,000 becquerels. Uh, as a comparison, a uh, typical human has like uh, 16, uh, 16 milligrams of potassium-40 and we will you know, produce ap approximately 4,400 becquerels each. So he was still uh, over, uh, over 50 times as radioactive as an average person after these 30 years. Uh, Manhattan Project. It created uh, atom bombs, and this was also supposed to be used, but it was all ruined by Japan surrendering. 
So they were like, what do we do? Well, let's use it for, for uh, scientific use and let's create this daemon core. And this is actually like the, like the actual atom bomb part. Uh, 6.2 kilograms of plutonium. Um, so uh, first accident was when uh, Harry Daglian was plugging this neutron reflector. So the idea is that they are actually like reflecting neutrons back to it, and uh, and uh, that way you can adjust the the uh, fission rate. But he dropped accidentally one on top of it, and it was super critical. Uh, he he managed to just, uh, just push it off with his hand, but he died 25 days later. A uh, security guard uh, who was just three, four meters away uh, died 33 years after uh, in leukemia. And uh, estimated dose is about two gray and uh, 0 .01, uh, 0 0.001 gray of neutron radiation. We'll, 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 we'll get to this question. See, we got this plural in here. Um, experiments continued, and Louis Lottin was the head physicist. Um, he was enjoying the fame. Um, he wore blue jeans and cowboy boots to work, and uh, often wanted to have like an audience, so he would perform tests in front of the audience. And uh, famous physicist Enrico Fermi had told the Slotin that, that they'd die in a year if they continue doing these dangerous practices. So instead of using these shims that were, were the industry standard, he just had this flat-shaped screwdriver to adjust and maintain a gap with reflectors. This procedure was known as tickling the dragon's tail or tickling the sleeping dragon. One day, it slipped, and the gap closed. Instant flash of blue light, uh, mo most likely Cherenkov radiation, uh, where, where uh, the particles actually make the, uh, make the water illuminate, and a wave of heat, and, and slotting quickly tipped this top shell off to stop the chain reaction. And he got 20 grays of neutron radiation and 1.14 uh, grays of gamma radiation and died just nine days after. Uh, because he was working close, his body was shielding partially others. Um, Alvin Graves, who was behind uh, Slotin, uh, died in the age of 55. He received uh, approximately 1.66 gray of, of uh, neutron radiation and 0.26 gray of gamma radiation. Uh, it is possible that this heart condition was, was affected by this event, but it's not absolutely certain. And after this, no more manual tests were permitted and the core was ultimately just melted down and uh, used in other projects. Let me talk about Mars Bluff B47 incident. So let's carry a nuclear bomb to UK. And um, there was this warning light and the crew member went to check the bomb bay and actually triggered the emergency release. This fell off the South Carolina uh, house yard on a kid's playhouse. And the, because there was conventional explosives to start the actual fission, they exploded. Uh, the family of four was injured, but luckily there was no fission warhead. It was not installed at the time, but still it was thought, that, okay, maybe, maybe we need to think about something about this safety when we transport this, these things. So new accidents wouldn't happen, right? <coughs> right? Goldsboro B-52 crash. A bomber broke in midair, carrying two nuclear bombs. Um, so, unclassified 2013, uh, they actually came scarily close to detonation. Um, they, uh, one of the parachutes 
failed to deploy. Uh, the one that was successful, it was found that three out of four safety mechanisms had disengaged and only the arm safe switch was keeping it from actually detonating. The arming sequence had otherwise completed. Other one had its parachute failing to deploy and, and crashed into this muddy soil and disintegrated. Uh, there was this unclosed high voltage switch which had prevented its arming sequence. So um, in 2013, Lieutenant Jack Revell, former EOD op a officer, recalled the moment when the, uh, when the second bomb switch was found. He said in a quote, until my death, I will never forget hearing my sergeant say, Lieutenant, we found the arm slash safe switch. And I said, great. He said, not great, it's on arm. So they had one bomb which was only kept by the arm safe switch from exploding and they found the other one which was actually armed. Um, more civilian side, uh, Soviet Union used this, of course radioactivity was a good thing and, uh, and uh, human life wasn't that important in Soviet Union. Um, they had these thermoelectric generators which were used in places where it was hard to go and they needed some electricity and heat. And uh, in Georgia they had built this uh, dam and they needed, especially during the construction time, these radio transmitters. Uh, B-time units used uh, strontium-90 and they would create electricity with the electron flow and uh, then the radioactivity will also produce warm. Soviet Union collapsed. Nobody was in charge of collecting these. Great. Um, then in Georgia, uh, I seem to have forgotten to put the year, just a second. Nope. But uh, this was in the late 90s, if I remember correctly. Um, three men found and uh, found these units and then the, they had been dismantled, possibly taken for scrap and then just the cores left, left in there. And it was cold winter and they found these canisters that, that you know, seemed to melt some snow and the ground was steaming a little bit. So what do they do? This must be a really good thing. Hey. It was getting late. Let's camp in the forest. Let's use heat from these sources to keep our camp warm. We don't need water. Let's have dinner and, have some, and some vodka here. This is post-Soviet Union. And they will get ill. <coughs> and they started vomiting. They thought that maybe uh, we didn't drink that much, maybe, maybe we just did, or maybe we have a food poisoning. And uh, then they hung the units to their backpacks and headed home the next day. And uh, the relatives actually contacted medical authorities when they, when they thought that maybe these things, magical things that they found have something to do. Um, one of the men died close to 900 days after. Uh, it's estimated to have, he's estimated to have from 2.8 to 5.4 gray, but it was mostly affecting his shoulder area and his heart and lungs, so he, that killed him. Uh, others actually may have gotten more, more radiation, but it was better distributed overall. Yeah, let's next go to Brazil, Goiani accident, a radio therapy device in a, in a medical facility. Originally, 74 terabecquerels of acti activity, which is tera, meaning billions, uh, five trillion banana equivalent. Uh, they moved to new premises that they had some, some sort of uh, altercation with the, with the owner of the previous rented location and, and he prevented them from recovering the radioactive source in 1987. Uh, with, the, with the help of police officers. Four months later, a security guard never showed up and two burglars entered the facility and saw this device and were like, this could be valuable scrap metal. At this point, it still had 
like 50 terabyte crores of activity. They started dismantling the device before starting to feel sick. And, uh, and both were vomiting and having diarrhea. And uh, other guy's hand was also starting to swell. Well, he went to see a doctor. The doctor was, didn't mention anything about the device, of course. And it was dismissed as food poisoning. The other man continued and was able to remove the protective wheel around the source and punctured next day the window, allowing him to see that wonderful blue glowing substance inside. He thought it might be some sort of explosive thing like gunpowder, removed some of it with a screwdriver, tried to, li tried to light it, but it didn't burn. So he did what's reasonable and sold the item to a scrap yard. Owner of the scrap yard saw this substance and thought that it must be supernatural or highly valuable at least, and, and let's invite all people to come and see this, what we found. Look, this is blue, it glows. Um, on the third day, he shared it, some of it with his friends before selling the material to yet another scrapyard, but not before his brother also was able to scrape some for himself and take it home and spread some of it on the concrete floor of his house, where his six-year-old daughter was fascinated by the glow and was starting to play with it and also apparently ate some of it with her sandwich she was eating on the floor at the time. Uh, the daughter absorbed one terabyte of the material, also got huge amount of, of radioactive material inside her body and was exposed to six grays of radiation. Remember the guy who was exhumed had 225,000 becquerels and now we are talking about billions of becquerels, not thousands. Uh, any guesses what happens to the daughter? Um, 15 days after the death, the, the wife of the, uh, of the middle scrapyard owner took the, uh, went to the uh, new scrapyard, took the item, take it, took it to the hospital because she started to suspect that the, it had something to do with people falling ill around her. A medical physicist examined the item and found out that it's goddamn radioactive. Uh, hospital was evacuated and stuff. Um, one, uh, totally 130,000 people went to hospitals to be tested. Uh, most of them not contaminated. Uh, 120 had actually internal contamination, so they got this substance into their bodies. 20 persons had radiation sickness. Uh, the six-year-old daughter died. Uh, two scrapyard workers died, and the wife of the scrapyard owner died of, of radiation. Uh, scrapyard owner survived despite seven days of, of exposure. He later died of liver cirrhosis due to uh, alcoholism and depression because, well, he took this naturally pretty harshly. He had no idea. Um, just for comparison, how much terabyte cross are, everybody knows smoke detectors may have radioactive substances. They typically contain around 40 nanobecquerels. Nano is like, what is it, one, one million, oh, billion, one billion. So we are talking about billion times billion times the amounts. Uh, they managed to recover 44 terabecquerels of the material, seven was left unrecovered. Now we talk about Anatoly Bugarski. In other words, is it worth it to put your head in a particle accelerator? He was working on the proton particle beam accelerator and writing his PhD. And uh, he was checking uh, for a faulty piece <coughs> of an equipment when the safety mechanism failed and he got a 76 giga electron volt proton beam through his head. He described the vision as brighter than a thousand suns. Uh, he was thought to have 2,000 to 3,000 rays of exposure. So he understood what happened, but did not tell anyone and kept on working as usual for that day. Normal, no? Um, next, uh, next we will have the only medical image in this presentation, but it's not bad. But if you are, if you are e easily, uh, let's say, affected, you can take a slight peek and find it that it's actually pretty safe. Uh, this is his medical image. His face started to swell, skin started to peel, and the beam had burned a path through his face and brain. 
He did not die. He returned to his work and finished his PhD. Uh, he had some medical issues, like like he didn't hear anything with his left ear, but but this uh, constant tinnitus, and uh, and he will he will kind of get more exhausted easy, easily when doing mental tasks, and uh, his face was partially paralyzed, and occasionally he will have seizures, but overall pretty uh, pretty mild issues. So why was this? It was so localized that it actually just burned this narrow part through the brain and did nothing worse. Um, anybody want to comment on the proton beam accident or shall we continue? Which one? Uh, yes, but we are not we are not going to have me, uh, any medical images of him. Yes, we'll we'll get there if we just and we have the time, I believe. Um, K nineteen. Um, there's a movie about this, uh, starring Harrison Ford, titled. Some K, well, K432 Widowmaker or something like that. It's not a good movie, but it tells about the incident. It's way too American. If you want to hear Russian soldiers speaking English in Russian accent, go see the movie. Uh, this was an especially unlucky Soviet nuclear submarine. Uh, they were in a hurry to produce this, so it was rushed through production and testing, and, and what could possibly go wrong? Well, already eight people died while constructing the submarine. Uh, two men were killed in a fire, and uh, six women who were, who were doing the lining uh, were killed by the fumes when they were working inside the submarine. Uh, two men were additionally killed when they were loading torpedoes <laughs> into the submarine. Uh, when it was uh, smashed with a bottle of champagne, Contrary by traditions, it was done by a man, a captain, and the bottle did not break, which is also typically took, uh, taken as a bad omen. Uh, 1960, the control rods were bent, the reactor had to be replaced. And uh, after it was tested, how, how good is it actually like submerging? The rubber ceiling in this had detached and had to be reapplied in the whole submarine. So on Soviet standards, pretty good. First of May is approaching. First dive to maximum depth. Oops, our, <laughs> our reactor is flooded because the gasket wasn't replaced when the when the when the uh, reactor had to be replaced. Uh, the crew have also disposed wooden crates via the wastewater system, clogging it and yet again flooding one of the one of the vessel compartments. And uh, in December 1960, uh, it had a loss of coolant, so the cooling water, it was halted for a week before specialists that were sent on board immediately were able to fix the reactor and they were able to carry on. And so 1961, right before May Day, the end of April, it's, it's commissioned. Nothing can go wrong now, right? Oops, accident on surfacing. We just we just disabled the long range radio, but hey, well, let's just go on with our test mission. Uh, they were, they were uh, operating uh, near the North Pole, and the sea eye and stuff, and on surfacing, they just busted their radio. At 4.15 a.m., loss of coolant accident. Coolant was leaking, and the pump was unable to cool the reactor anymore. And they immediately went scram, but there's the decay heat that, hey, well, it still continues to produce heat and we don't have cooling. What do we do? We improvise. Uh, let's use some uh, air vent tube and valve and weld it to the reactor, but the problem is that the reactor is pretty damn active. Um, 
and then the uh, radioactive steam uh, all the steam carried radioactive co components all over the submarine and the engineers had to go to the actually like the inside uh, next to the reactor to fix it without any proper protective gear apparently they had like a chemical warfare protection gear but but nothing to protect them from the from the uh, gamma rays all the engineers and their officer later died of their injuries uh, within three weeks. 14 other members died within two years. Uh, Soviet military naturally just brushed it under the carpet and was that, uh, well, the diseases they suffered was a mental disorder, asthenia vegetative syndrome. Uh, let's see if I have, no, I don't have any, any new slide for this, but uh, later on it crashed into a US submarine and um, and then it had two fires before it was reclassified as a, like a support support submarine and, and still had a one short circuit which killed one and injured one. Oh, and one of the fires actually killed 12 crew members. Uh, it was not known as the Widowmaker, but the, but the Soviet sailors called it uh, with the nickname Hiroshima. Next, we travel to what is modern-day Ukraine. Kramatorsk was built in 1980, uh, this building, and uh, on a quarry, they lost this thickness measurement device, which used, used uh, cesium in a small capsule. Pretty small capsule. It was, it was searched with the, with, the, uh, with the Soviet efficiency for a week, before it was like, well, it, I don't know, gone somewhere. It, ended, it had ended up in the gravel that was used for constructing homes. And the capsule ended in, inside a wall of, uh, wall of a home or actually like two, between two apartments. A child's bed was located right next to the place where the capsule was within the wall. After the uh, child had died, uh, a year later an 18 year old died and then her 16-year-old brother, all of leukemia. A new family moved into the home and they son died of leukemia too. The father forced an investigation and originally it was said that, well, maybe they have some genetic condition that kind of is to attribute, but the capsule was found and uh, totally of 17 people living there had been irradiated in addition to the disease. And uh, it was identified when it was recovered by the serial number which was, which was utilized in these things and uh, traced back to the quarry. Uh, nowadays, well, of course, uh, there are, let's say, some, some safeguards about radioactivity and stuff, especially like on scrapyards and stuff where they actually have gamma ray detectors to make sure that they don't actually accidentally get radioactive stuff. But hey, this can, cannot happen in the Western world, right? So uh, this year earlier, again, cesium 137, there's this uh, sensor that was measuring some sort of a flow at the Rio Tinto Gudai Dari mine, and it was to be trans uh, transported to Perth for, for maintenance. And on 25th, the gods was found to be one of the four mounting bolts and all the screws and the capsules had also disappeared somewhere. Turns out that the capsule had apparently gotten lost during the truck drive. Well, there were urgent uh, health, in, uh, health warnings not to touch the capsule keeper. If you happen to find it, just uh, and uh, if you drive here, if you have driven here, please check the threads of your tires. And uh, actually, they were they found it with the with the vehicle that was trying to search for this device uh, or this capsule because of the radiation it emitted. Uh, yeah, the bolts had loosened to the vibration and the capsule was small enough to fall through, through one of these like uh, mounting bolts holes. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about INES levels. Um, now that we get to towards 
you know it's Chernobyl. Um, they got basically levels from zero to seven. Zero is like, well, something happened, but it has no safety significance. Um, anomaly is something that could have been bad incident is like, well, a little bit something bad happened. Uh, we talk about accidents only when they have like local consequences. So, so outside of the reactor building, three is typically uh, in, uh, in uh, something serious inside the building. Uh, in Finland in 2020, in a, four, uh, in a zero Olkiluoto shut down due to this salt filter substances. Things like that, everything gets reported nicely, especially on the Western world. Um, in Sweden, Forsmark, INES 2, two out of four backup generators failed. The faults could have affected all. So it was like, hey, this could have been serious. Uh, Three Mile Island uh, was five, uh, as, was, as well was this Goyania incident earlier, 1987. Uh, Tokaimura, which was mentioned, 1999, was level four. And Chernobyl and Fukushima are the only ones who got seven out of seven. So Tokamura accident, uranium reprocessing plant, let's use some of the uranium uh, fuel and, and re reprocess it to make sure that we get back to our, uh, all this precious uranium. They didn't have an alarm system. Uh, so all the measurements and stuff were subject to human errors. Uh, management knew that they wouldn't pass the inspection if they submitted their, their, uh, their protocols, so they just didn't. And company was you know, running near zero profit, so cost saving was especially important, and this was like uh, something they had just recently started doing. And they were, they were processing uranium hexafluoride to uranium dioxide for plant for use. Uh, so uh, this is the chemical process that they actually used. Uh, put it in the acid, put, it, put, the, uh, put the solution in a buffer tank, which is specifically shaped so that it cannot go, uh, cannot go critical, where, and from which it will, in small portions, will be taken to precipitation tank, add some ammonia. Ammonia should take any waste contaminants uh, before it's taken to dissolving tanks and, uh, and purified. So to speed up this process, Let's skip the buffer tank. What could possibly go wrong? Let's pour this straight into this precipitation tank, which is not protected against criticality events. Of course, they, they weren't trained for this properly. No training, no, no introduction given to the workers. Just told them to do this, do that. And uh, it was supposed to be added in 2.4 kilogram additions, but, but when you are just boring, pouring something out of a bucket, then you just don't know how much you're putting stuff in there. Uh, precipitation tank reached approximately 16 kilograms of uranium and went critical. Level was seven times the allowed limit. So two workers were there pouring the solution. Uh, the supervisor was roughly four meters away. Everybody noticed a flash of bluish light and gamma radiation alarm went immediately on. Uh, the workers went to the contamination room where the person who was closest, who was actually like pouring and not just assisting on it, started vomiting and to lose consciousness, which is not a good sign. Uh, the products contaminated the whole building and the surroundings. And uh, next day, they managed to stop it by, by draining the cooling water around the precipitation tank because it was uh, adding, it was working as a like a uh, as a neutron uh, reflector and a moderator. And then they used boron or, uh, or the boronic acid for capturing the neutrons also. That works kind of like poisoning, poisoning the solution. By, uh, five hours, the nearest buildings ever created and 12 hours, the whole city was ever created. It was classified as INES level four. The technician closes got 17 seabirds, others had 10 and three, and the two worst affected died of the in injuries. Uh, the first one received a bone marrow transplant, 
but still uh, it's a common. And um, his injuries were horrific. Basically, his skin dissolved. I'm not going to go into gory details. Don't Google those pictures. Um, and he was revived multiple times, even, even though uh, uh, the relatives were against this. But in, under Japanese laws, if the, if the person hasn't communicated it, they will just revive them, even if, if it seems like futile and they just, he has no chance to survive. But then they just kind of, you know, kept him in agony for, a, for nearly three months. Uh, second technician had extensive uh, skin grafts and, and, and medical procedures, but still died of lung and kidney failure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He he could he couldn't communicate to, with people anymore, and and it's basically just horrific. But I think there maybe the doctors also uh, also thought about their uh, their <laughs> legal repercussions if they just violated the law. That are they you know is this medical malpractice or in worst case is this a murder? Uh, yeah, the supervisor survived. I believe that the supervisor was was subject to some uh, legal repercussions afterwards. Yes. Yeah, he was um, after that for three months getting into a uh, bar with the police. Yeah. So uh, he was he was charged and convicted, and uh, laws were later changed to this uh, re reprocessing operations. Okay. Let's talk about Chernobyl. Um, a three gigawatt power plant, worst nuclear accident in history. And they wanted to test that, hey, how long can we, if, if the steam was to be cut from heat production, outside power isn't available, how long can we just run the plant's cooling pumps with the, with the, with the turbine if, if we just do it like this? Uh, it was supervised with a, with a, with a, by an engineer with no experience in nuclear power. His expertise was, was uh, uh, was this uh, hydro power. Um, Tesla was supposed to start, but there were production issues elsewhere and they needed power, so they just continued. Um, the morning shift had already disabled some of the automatic safety features, did not tell it to the next shift, and evening shift, uh, evening shift didn't know about it, and then naturally the night shift that ended up doing the actual test didn't know. One of the systems was the emergency core cooling system. Um, as mentioned earlier, it had this dangerous feature of positive void coefficient. If the coolant started to boil, the steam bubbles will increase the reaction speed. Um, additionally, the control rods were made of graphite, so when it's, uh, it also works as a, as a, like a neutron capture, but it also works as a neutral moderator, which is a little bit iffy. Um, when the steam input was then cut, the output of the turbine decreased, or the water pumps don't work as well, and they start to, and the steam bubbles start to form inside the reactor. Unfortunately, the fuel poisoning started to reduce the power output. Um, they turned on the automatic regulators, but the, out of the two units, the AR2 unit failed to operate. AR1 removed all control rods. It operated to, uh, to improve the, uh, to uh, uh, like uh, increase the reaction rate. But to correct the failure, they, they started to reduce the po power further. Uh, it went to 5% of the plant test level, the, which was 700 megawatts. So they started to uh, re rapidly remove the control rods to increase the power output. And when the power level was 200 megawatts, they decided that, oh, now is the time to continue. It, it's a little bit short of 700, but 200, 700, ballpark. What could possibly go wrong? Coolant flow was reduced, so 
They decided, let's do the only sensible thing. Let's remove even more control rods to increase the reaction rate. Uh, operating design required that at, at least five of them need to be present, but the, at this point the team, uh, the, the crew had removed almost all of them. System had no indication or any view on, on how many control rods are they actually present in the reactor at, at given time. Um, so the system was closing on to the actual like boiling heavily, which will then increase the thermal power even further. And then they decided now is the time to start our test. Soon after they started the test, computer warns of a possible core meltdown. The warning was ignored. Normal. Uh, the water flow was reduced even more because they didn't get, they didn't get the, uh, the enough power from the turbine. So more steam bubbles started to be generated in uh, the coolant flow. Uh, nobody knows why, because the persons are no longer with us or weren't with us soon after the accident. Um, the scram button was pressed 36 seconds later. Uh, the test was supposed to be run up to 40 seconds. Uh, control rods were being automatically deployed at this fast speed of 40 centimeters per second. So it will take 14 to 18 seconds to actually re reach the end position. But because the, they chose the graphite, it will actually temporarily increase the thermal output uh, because water was also a neutron absorber and then, then it will also work as a neutron moderator uh, when it just glances it slightly. So they increased the thermal production with this choice. Um, this actually had been observed in 1983 in, in Ingalina power plant uh, in modern day Lithuania, I think, but no changes to security designs was made. Three seconds later, some of the fuel rods cracked, preventing control rods from proceeding any further, jumped one third of the way. The reactor power output rose to 530 megawatts. The scram process continued and uh, the thermal peak was estimated to be around 30,000 megawatts. Remember this was rated to 3,000. Uh, some estimates have also given that it's about 300,000 and this is all do, uh, done with uh, after the fact modeling because there was no equipment to actually measure this and record this. Steam explosion happens, the reactor casing is burst as well as the reactor building and then uh, just a little bit later, a second more powerful explosion happened and threw pieces of graphite, nuclear fuel and other radioactive waste around the premises. The graphite, of course, caught fire and it will further spread the radioactive fallout in the air with the smoke. Of course, this was a state secret. There was the May Day was coming, nearby town of Pripyat was preparing for the big celebration, so let's not say anything. Just minor fire, trans minor fire. Um, in some areas around the, the reactor, this uh, little am amount of radiation will be within five minutes. Uh, the dosimeter that would have been able to capture these levels was somewhere under the rubble. They had another unit on site, but it didn't work, normal. No? And the, then it was assumed that I, I think the reactor core, it's, it's good, it's good. I don't think it, it, was, it was reactor core that exploded or damaged by this. And, and then they sent the military and civilian emergency services to combat it and well, some of them lost their lives and stuff, which is pretty sad, but they were able to fight the fire and contain the unit with concrete. Uh, any questions, comments about Chernobyl? Let's start here. What is the other plant? Where is that uh, uh, Pardon? A little bit louder, please. What? Can you repeat the question a little bit louder? I couldn't hear. Uh, what is the other control rods that you remember? Yes, there, there is the, uh, the, uh, the um, because the core melted, uh, it, it was captured, there was this, like this, uh, um, 
there is this containment area where if in case of a, of a meltdown, it was supposed to capture and it's like work, something worked there, good. Um, it did capture and there's like this elephant's foot that's formed and it's been, uh, there's a photo taken by robots from this area because it's deadly to a human, yes. Yeah, they had they had the dosimeters, which was like um, uh, was it a, like uh, the background radiation was like was it three kilo rads or something, and then the me measurement devices, the maximum level was something like ten rad per second or something. So uh, they, they that's what they thought that okay, this maxes out, but I think we're good. This is this is like a you know this was like a normal like this normal operation range uh, radiation level measurement device and the you know the emergency ones one one is in the rubble other one doesn't work. I haven't seen the miniseries. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, if if ever in Russia you see a swan lake uh, on TV, you know something bad has happened. This happened again here. Uh, yet another fun fact: some uh, during this ongoing war, some Ukrainian hackers hacked some Russian TV channel and put Swan Lake on just to <laughs> shit and giggles. Okay. So. Um, it had quite a few direct fatalities, two more possible in 10 years, which are like possibly attributable, but not, not certain. Um, the city was, or the town was evacuated 36 hours after the incident and explosion zone created. A reputation took a heavy blow. Uh, thyroid cancer in Belarus significantly increased. Belarus had the, the worst, worst uh, worst uh, pollution being downwind. Nowadays, you can visit Ghost Town of Pripyat. You should, if you do, don't touch anything, don't take anything from there. If you're a military force, don't dig in. Has happened recently. Um, and uh, fun fact, if you go to Pripyat, if you don't touch anything, if you are in the, in the, in the um, let's say the safe areas, how many of you has ever uh, gone to the uh, the uh, metro station of Kampi? Did you know that the the uh, escalators that go they go through this granite rock, which is pretty heavy uranium rich, and you actually have more background radiation in those escalators than you have in the town of Pripyat if you go there to visit. Of course, the thing is that all the, all the radioactive material, it's like now buried a little bit underground. So don't dig, don't pick anything up. But the background radiation is lower in Pripyat than, than it is in, in the Kampi metro station. Um, here is a um, um, little bit of a graph like, okay, how much radiation do you get? And this is again logarithmic scale. Every, every step is like 10 times the previous step. Um, then we can talk about events that are beyond our control, solar, solar events. So coronal mass ejection is where this uh, magnetic field and plasma mass are ejected to some, some sort of a magic event, which Shuk Resonant will tell us more about, but he's not here. Um, but uh, there's this disturbance in the magnetic field and then there's a lot of, lot of charged particles bursting from the sun and our magnetic field atmosphere protects us from these uh, charged particles. Magnetic storms may come, beautiful northern lights, 
sometimes power grids may be affected by these these events especially in north america there has happened because they didn't they didn't build a grid to be protected uh, from this finland has and this may be bad for satellites um, 2005 uh, giant sunspots noa 720 somebody had an imagination naming this um, it was an x-class solar flare the most powerful kind and uh, a billion ton cloud of electrified gas was hurled into the space uh, they reached the uh, earth moon system within minutes and uh, there was this proton storm that was that was created and well created pretty fancy auroras and, and some issues but 1978 there was even even worse case and at that point they realized that if you were an astronaut on spacewalk your spacesuit does not protect you against this it could have given you four grades of radiation which means that you need to be evacuated to to medical care to earth if this happens so theoretically if you are outside uh, outside there in the outer space and not inside a proper spaceship you can actually die from these from these local events let's talk about galactic events gamma ray burst from a supernova uh, these are much much more massive events than what happened happens on the sun and there is some uh, with my novice understanding uh, a plausible one that one one extinction event 450 million years ago may have been attributed to one of these so there's this uh, huge energies in uh, really narrow jets going in opposite directions from a from a supernova or star collapsing and this is like huge energetic gamma radiation a lot of it and uh, should one point to point to earth well pardon my friends but we will be fucked there's no protection for us um, if one of these just wipe, wiped out like uh, like half of the biomass including the sea then well, well us mammals on the top of the soil have no chance And with this happy note, I'm ready for questions, comments, sticks and stones. Well, this was always unpredictable and very terrifying. <laughs> Nobody can save you. We will all be eaten. Yeah, but it looks a lot of fun. Yeah, looks fun. Yeah, uh, as I understood, uh, also in supernova, that the the exterior just is is blasted to the space, and then the interior is like compressed. And and ah, oh, sorry, I misheard the question. Can you then repeat the question? Yeah. Sorry, because this very dynamic. I was also imagining like an apocalyptic thing, which is explosion, but actually that's just turned into like a huge radiation. Yes, it it the ex explosion is from overheating into when we are when we are talking about that um, especially if it's like uh, uh, let's say hydrogen bombs which are like uh, super fast events where the temperature rises to millions of degrees of Kelvin and uh, that is that is uh, uh, like a fast self-feeding process so uh, it, it usually starts or there's they try to start this with with like contracting the the uh, f uh the fission bomb to set off this but in the end it's like the heat as we all know you know heat and uh heated gas just tends to expand and at that temperature everything turns into gas or plasma and producing terrifying effects so yeah Uh, 
Um, the short answer will be that it depends on what you say is normal. Uh, again, we talk about how much, do, how much radiation do we accept, how much excess risk, because we know that all radiation is bad, how much do we accept. Um, uh, then there's a lot of, lot of the uh, nuclear fission products are short-lived, which means that, that the half-life is fast and then they will just uh, go away. There are longer half-lives, but then the funny, pi funny part of it is that whatever, uh, whatever has a long half-life will not be as radioactive. Uh, depleted uranium is actually pretty inert. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid of, of like holding, my, holding depleted uranium or that metallic uranium in my hand. I, I would wash my hands after that for sure. But when it's on top of my skin, it's not that scary. When it's inside my body, it is. And contamination is that when you may have these radioactive particles in your surroundings, they will end up inside you, that's bad. Um, and uh, the problem again with depleted uranium, for example, in weapons, is that when they are pulverized and they end up in your lungs, it's, it's a heavy metal. Uh, and just like with, with, with radon, uh, it doesn't, it isn't super active, but whatever happens there will just lead to chain of events and some of them are really active and, and you will get a lot of radiation and it will stick to your lungs and continue to cause the alpha particle bombardment there. And mucous membranes are especially uh, receptible for that because our skin, basically the outer layer conta uh, contains dead cells. So alpha radiation doesn't penetrate our skin properly. But the, this is that it depends on what's there. Uh, cesium is bad because it gets bound to your bones. Um, it has pretty good half-life. Uh, it's just when we decide that something is safe enough for us to live in. There is no reason. Of course, if you, if you say that, okay, well, you know, hang out here for an hour and you die, we know that that is not acceptable place to live. But when it's like, okay, well, this will increase 10% chance for lung cancer. Is it habitable or not? Um, in Ohio, can't remember the county, there was this uh, military depleted uranium lab. They suspected that there's something wrong with the lab um, in, the, in the filtering system. And there was this study that proved that people actually get lung cancer, like their risk of lung cancer around the plant was increased 73%, even when they took into account like, uh, like factors like uh, gender and uh, smoking and uh, uh, ethnic profile and stuff like that. And still like in, within all groups, they found out that the risk has increased and it was pretty sure telltale that yes, something wrong with their filters, that they had been like leaking a uranium dust into the air. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, INES is pretty much as far as my opinion counts, it's, it's pretty fact-based. Like, okay, like, uh, is it localized? Is it, is it just within the plant or next to the plant? Or has it like widespread consequences uh, or like international consequences like with Chernobyl and uh, and well, Fukushima didn't have that much international consequences, but it still got rated as a seven. Yeah, yeah, but those are political yeah. choices, and and then you know, there's this, there are these coal miners; they need the money. Uh, where? Uh, Fukushima. Yeah, in, around Fukushima, yes, there was um, 
because a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the radioactive material that got emitted went into the ocean or into the atmosphere as venting. They were they were venting radioactive gases uh, from the from the units to release the pressure, which was like better alternative than letting it explode, in my opinion. Uh, so it's it's a little bit. Uh, it's a good question that, okay, if you just release radioactive gas, does it affect everybody around you? Sorry? The people downwind are going to be people. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially in, in Chernobyl because the wind was blowing towards Europe and it's just like, well, fine. Yeah, nuclear waste management I didn't talk about. It's also an interesting subject. Where do we store it? How risky is it? Is it? And uh, like there's a, let's say, like there's a, like low-grade waste, which is like, well, all, all the suits and everything used in there, which may have like, I don't know, like 10% oh, more radiation than, than a clean one. And then there's this used nuclear fuel, which is really mean. But again, here is the twofold thing. Um, if anything is highly active, it's gone rather fast. If something is, is uh, if something has a low activity rate, it's going to be uh, uh, around as long, but it's not that dangerous. Yeah. How do how do how do we how how do we mark these sites so that you know the next culture will not go digging and wonder what this is? Um, possib possibly we should mark them in a way in a permanent fashion that it's obvious and clear and we shouldn't touch. But I don't know. Uh, it's it's again there are good horror elements that hey there's this some some glyphs about here about doom and despair, but let's go get the treasure anyway. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. But again, the most, the biggest danger is that if it enters our uh, water streams and stuff instead of like being there. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's localized. If, if an adventurer digs into our uh, used nuclear fuel sites and then gets radiated, that's like one person or if it's like entering the stream and, and just poisoning a lot of people, then that's way worse. Talk, talk about like again the Guyana accident, which was like well, just people like spreading around and putting spreading like <laughs> like radioactive cesium on their floors. Yes, for the rest of your life. I, I believe the color is, uh, when it's depicted as green, it's usually like, well, people associate that with toxics and stuff, might be that. Uh, the substance itself isn't blue. Uh, usually it's like uh, called Cherenkov radiation, which is when, uh, when the particles uh, are slowed down by the water and the, actually the color comes from uh, either the water as a, as a fluid or a water vapor emitting this blue light. So the radioactive material itself, if you, if you place it in a vacuum, it's not going to have this glow. But it's like the surrounding air that produces the glow. And also other, other gases and materials can provide different colors. Uh, 
it may be sometimes bluish green if you have a, this general radiation, but it's it's beautiful looking. Yeah, yeah. The 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 night sides contain tritium, which was the hydrogen, uh, slightly radioactive hydrogen, uh, and I believe it is mixed with phosphorus that it actually creates the color comes from phosphorus, uh, and not from the actual like element, but the but the energy to the phosphorus comes from this this radioactive. Uh, so no, that's the Geiger counter. Uh, as far as I know, you can't hear these particles flying. I don't know, if somebody has a really good ear, maybe. I mean, if you can hear the radiation, you're probably fucked. Yeah, or, or, or you have a, uh, have a hearing implant. I think we have time for one, for one more question, and I'll pick it from here. Yeah, we, we, we discussed the proton beam accident earlier when, when the Soviet scientist had a proton beam through his head. Um, and he described it as like seeing a light like a thousand suns. But there, it was probably, probably triggered by the optic nerve more than like radiation itself. And uh, they, they, it, is, it is ionizing, so it, it creates ions, it may possibly excite the neurons or, or make some uh, ions that will excite these neural pathways. Who knows, who knows? I'm not a brain surgeon or a physicist. All right. How can it make you like, experimenting? Yeah, let's, let's, not, let's not do human experiments anymore. All right, thank you.